study in the lab. This was a much longer study. It was 16 subjects. They came in at 11, 7 in the morning, and they stayed awake until 9 o'clock in the morning the following day for 27 hours. So, yes, it is torture in case you're, you're thinking that it was a little bit as close to torture as I ever would allow us to do. Um, we expose them to these three conditions here. So, number three, uh, study nights separated by at least one week from each other. Uh, one day would come in and they would remain in a dark room. By a dark room, it means less than a lot at the end level. So it's really very dark room um, that they were able to navigate, but it really wasn't stimulating any of their, their stimulism. Um, the other night, they would come in and every four hours they were exposed to either blue or red light. We always did measurements prior to and after the condition, which was again dim light or photolux of blue or photolux of red light. What we saw in these studies was a series of, of interesting outcomes, again, consistent with what we had um, predicted we would see. First of all, um, their melatonin levels is long during the day, as expected, regardless of what experimental conditions they were in. Um, at night, you see high melatonin levels with both dark and red light, as expected, because my light will not suppress melatonin at the levels we were working with. And you did see a suppression of melatonin with blue light. What we also saw in terms of cortisol levels is there was a little bit of a, an impact during the day, but no significant differences. But we did see a significant increase in cortisol levels in the middle of the night with both red and blue light. And with alpha amylase, there was a slight change, a slight decline, but it wasn't as significant as the ones with the cortisol levels. So as expected, uh, blue light impacted melatonin, and then both blue and red light impacted cortisol levels. We also saw um, a change in heart rate. This is only for the nighttime portion of the study, and this is comparing what we call condition minus initial. Initial is the measurement we do it only in the dark, and then we, we look at the difference between remaining in darkness for an hour or being exposed to blue or red light. And what we saw is there was an increase in heart rate with the red and the blue light, and there was a decrease in heart rate for people remaining in darkness. Uh, we also saw an increase in performance. Uh, this is reaction time throughput, so higher throughput means you're performing better. And again, compared to remaining in darkness, we saw an increase in reaction time throughput. Uh, this is another type of performance test. It's called matching the sample. And this is more of a cognition test. So you have a pattern that you see, and then you're presented with two patterns, and you have to select the right pattern. Um, and we measure, again, the number of correct answers and the time it took to answer, and we get this throughput. So higher throughput is better performance. And again, with both red and blue light, you see an increase in throughput or an increase in performance in that task. So just to summarize the, the, the studies that we have done up to now, and those have all mostly been nighttime studies that we have looked at, the results suggest that the pathway for melatonin suppression is not the only light sensitive pathway that can affect biomarkers, alertness, heart rate, and performance. And the question that we have next is, can I impact brain activities during the daytime hours? So we're interested in just looking specifically to the daytime. So more specifically, what we're interested in was the post-lunch day. Everybody goes through post-lunch day. Everybody's in the middle of the afternoon, gets a little bit sleepy, and said, well, can you use light to help increase alertness during those times of the day? Um, so we, uh, the goal was again to determine if the red or the blue light um, in the afternoon, close to the post lunch shift hours, increased alertness as measured by EEG and, and KSS, which is a subjective sleepiness scale. Um, we recruited 16 participants, 13 completed the study. We kept them on a regular schedule prior to the experiment. And during the weeks of the experiment, they come back for three weeks, again, separated by at least one week. And we used the muted chronotype just to make sure that they weren't. Very, very night owl was very, very large, so we wanted to keep them sort of in the middle of the, the current type of scale. So these were the procedures we had. So they would come in, um, we would again prepare them, outfit them with, with electrodes. We would keep them in the dark for the first 12 minutes of data collection. We would collect one KSS and one EEG measurement in the dark. Then we would turn on the lights and we would collect again six additional EEG measurements and three additional KSS measurements. So that's sort of to see the temporal effects of light over the course of this 48 minutes. Again, they sat in those very nice light boxes, which they love. 
did see um, a significant reduction in alpha power with the red light. The blue light was reduced, but it was not statistically significant. So we are seeing a stronger effect of red light during the daytime than we're seeing uh, blue light in terms of reducing alpha power. Um, this is the alpha beta. This is the power in the alpha beta range, which is, again, associated with sleepiness. So a high alpha beta means you sleepier. And we saw a significant decrease in the red light, uh, in the power when they're exposed to red light, a slight decrease in blue light, but again, that was not statistically significant to the main in darkness. And this is the data range, and data is really when you're starting to move closer and closer to falling asleep. Uh, we got high beta, and we again saw a uh, significant reduction in beta with the red light, but not with the blue light. So all the measures are indicating that you see the effect of red light in reducing sleepiness, you can see alertness, and the blue light is not as strong as the red light during the daytime hours, unlike what we saw during the nighttime hours. So just to summarize, the impact of different light colors on alertness seem to change depending on time of day. Um, blue light increases alertness at night and early morning, but not in the afternoon, or at least not significantly in the afternoon. Red light seems to impact alertness all times of day and night. Um, we are currently finishing up data collection with the white light. We're comparing white light with red light. And the main thing is we're very interested in seeing the exit. If this effect is the light itself, uh, the amount of light, or is it color information? I mean, our is a great example of red light, uh, red traffic light. It doesn't matter how bright it is, you're going to stop at a red traffic light because the color red gives you that information that you have to stop. Um, is that the same thing with the alertness? Are we having this alerting effect of red light not because of the amount of red light we're getting, but just because we're getting them that color information? So we're not looking at white light at the same irradiance to see if that's a color information or if that's the same amount of light information. Um, and we do know that light can impact humans by factoring other neurological expression. I think it's particularly important for people who work in circadian rhythms where they can just be focused on cell phone suppression, cell phone rhythm. And there are various other biomarkers that we can impact with light in addition to our cell phone. And we are currently looking at the light effect on cortisol awakening response from the same different wavelengths and also on performance to see if we can see an increase in performance with the daytime hours with these lights. So, what are the implications for architecture? I think. Develop layers of light. You have to think about it, and that was discussed very nicely in the panel earlier, is to develop layers of light that you can increase alertness during the daytime hours. Um, develop lighting seems to shift towards it. We, we know that a female phone suppression has been linked in animal models to decrease tumor growth. So you don't want to suppress melatonin in the middle of the night to shift towards but at the same time, you want to keep them alert. So the use of red light may be a solution. The other important thing that we're seeing in terms of writing things on the map is that daytime light exposure, uh, in comparison to remaining in a dark room, for example, has helped these subjects stay awake at night, which is very interesting. It carries a material effect of light exposure during the day into the nighttime. Um, so it may be that for shift workers, the best lighting scheme is give them a lot of light when they get up during the daytime. And then give them red light at night. So I think there's a lot of implications for how we're going to develop lighting for healthcare applications, especially for shift workers, to increase alertness and reduce any negative side effects from them. So I would like to thank the organizers of the event for giving me the opportunity to speak here, uh, the project sponsors, and my colleagues at the Light Research Center. This is worth a whole lot of people to stay up for 27 hours. For weeks in a row, we need a lot of people on staff to do that. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Marianne. That was quite interesting. It's only the panel discussion. I'm still not sure if architecture students should have a red light or a blue light on at night when they're doing their own letters. Uh, that remains for them to experiment with. I think we'll time for one question. Excellent. One question? If not, of course, you can have a chance. All right. We've been talking a lot about 
the circadian rhythms for healthcare and for shift workers. Um, my husband was a, a fighter pilot in the Navy, um, which is a huge issue for circadian rhythm and sleeping, especially since you share a room with four other pilots and they have to be always at a different time that you're flying. I noticed that one of your sponsors was the Navy, and you guys had talked about with Mark about doing research. Uh, in some areas, do you guys also do research for people like the Navy pilots that have to be on high alert at all times? Yeah, I mean, we, we currently are not 